2018 through 2019 and even in 2020 has been an exciting year for fans of virtual gaming on modern PCs and modern gaming consoles. We've received a bunch of really great new um, arcade collections for games from Taito and SNK. We have received anniversary collections for the Mega Man and Mega Man X series, along with an upcoming collection for the Zero games. The existing ports of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, along with Icewind Dale and Neverwinter Nights, have gotten console releases for the first time, um, both digitally and in collected physical editions, making these games accessible not only to new players, but from players back in the day who never had computers who could run them. And all of these ports play well. And then on top of all of that, we've gotten collected editions of the first three Bard's Tale games and a remastered edition of the original Wasteland, all designed with some graphical tweaks and improvements to make them look decent on modern televisions to give them quality of life improvements like auto mapping, um, having the journal entries available in the game, dumping some of the copy protection BS from those old games would have had all to make them again accessible and bringing DOS games to all again to an entirely new audience. Now audiences who back in the day could have played them on their old computers but maybe didn't know about them or maybe didn't have access to them. In short, much as was the case with the early days of the PlayStation and into the PlayStation 2, game studios have come to realize that there is tremendous value in their back catalog and it is worth their while not just to bring these games forward to a new generation as is, as is the case with some arcade ports from like the PS2 era where it's just dropping this game as is into the software, but also with tweaks to make them more accessible, but without betraying things that make those games great, and just as importantly, to, on top of everything else, surface stuff that about the history of the game and the making of the game, like concept art and all the other sort of fun stuff to further wet people's interests in the game and the worlds that are contained within. This led me thinking about other game series that would merit this treatment, and I've come up with a handful of titles for an initial list. This is certainly not the be-all and end-all, and honestly, there are plenty of other titles that are worthy of inclusion, and also, as with all of my lists, this list is not ranked. Just because a game is number five doesn't mean I think it is inferior to the other titles on the list, just because a game is number one doesn't mean I think it's better than all the t other titles on the list. I'm going to try to limit myself to one game or series per genre, but this is going to be kind of loose as well. Like I am doing tactical RPGs, Japanese RPGs, and Western-style RPGs separately, and also I will be mentioning a few honorable mentions and stuff as well as I go through this. With those criteria out of the way... Let's begin. Number five, the early Shantae games. The Shantae series is an interesting case. It's a game series that has built a tremendous cult following for WayForward that started out in ways that weren't necessarily very accessible. The original Game Boy Color game, for example, had an incredibly small print run. The sequel, Risk is Revenge, came out through DSiWare, which means you had to have a DSi, and you had to find the game in the Nightmare, Nightmare Hellscape that was the DS eShop. While the game did get a re-release on the PS4, never got a similar release on the Switch or any of the other consoles the series has come to, has gotten a PC release though. But it's also never gotten a physical release. So I wouldn't mind seeing a remastered release of the original Shantae for the Game Boy Color either on its own, or as a physical release containing the remastered version of the second game as well, particularly since that port hasn't gotten a Xbox release, and I don't think it's received a Switch release either. So. That would also be a nice inclusion. Number four, the Evil East Collection. Final Fantasy Tactics for the PS1 is one of the first games I played when I got my PS1 back in high school, basically right behind Final Fantasy VII. It's a game with really strong game mechanics and an incredibly engrossing story based around a War of the Roses style conflict in the fantasy land of Evil East, which in turn ends up becoming something very different for protagonist Ramza Beilov as the story goes on. It's also a game which has some issues with loading times for the attack animations, particularly for some of the special attacks for characters, and even greater issues when it comes to translation of the game's story, which can get things very clunky at parts. Now, when Final Fantasy Tactics got a remastered release on the PlayStation Portable as War of the Lions, or with that subtitle, I was pumped. 
I could play the game on the go, and they got a newly remastered story with some more involved animated cutscenes. It was almost everything I wanted. Except it still had a few loading issues with animations, unless you then went and purchased a digital copy and or played it later on the Vita. And, well, I wanted to have that flexibility of playing it both handheld and on the go, and on my television, like I did with the original game back in the day. Basically, even then, I wanted the flexibility that the Switch provides. While the PlayStation TV would let you play, play um, PSP games on your television, also, if you didn't get one while they were super cheap and easy to get a hold of, then you couldn't get one. So there's that. But anyway, after Final Fantasy Tactics came out, we got additional games fleshing out the world of Ivalice, such as Vagrant Story for the PlayStation, Final Fantasy XII for the PlayStation 2, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance and uh, Tactics A2 on the Game Boy Advance and DS, and Final Fantasy Revenant Wings, which also came out for the DS. Of those, the one Ivalice game that has gotten a modern remastered release with appropriate quality of life improvements has been Final Fantasy XII, and it's gotten that on pretty much every platform. Um, Xbox, for the first time on a Microsoft platform, the uh, PlayStation 4, uh, Switch, and PC even as well. Although, obviously, the Switch only doesn't go quite up as high graphically as the other two ports, other ports do. The rest of the games, however, have not gotten the same new release on life. War of the Lions got a mobile version, which is which is nice, but the rest of them definitely have not. We have not gotten mobile versions of Tactics Advance, certainly nothing for Vagrant Story. And on top of all of this, I mean, the thing with the Android version is that it doesn't do the thing which I wanted most for when War of the Lions came out, which is to have the option to go kind of go back and forth between playing it in handheld or general stuff. And then when it came to the story and more narrative heavy parts of that, to play it on the TV screen the way I remember playing it. So, and also on top of all that, like A2, um, Taxi 2 Wild, it is playable on the 3DS along with the DSi. Um, it doesn't, there are, there are some functionality that is not accessible because it doesn't have a Game Boy Advance cartridge slot. There are some additional mechanical stuff in the game. Um, like I believe there's a few items with additional skills that you can only get if you have the GBA cartridge in the slot. Now, of course, I should mention all this counts double for the Tactics Ogre and Ogre Battle series. This is also a series where very few of the games got re-released. Only Tactics Ogre, Let Us Cling Together, got a modern re-release with improved graphics and tons of quality of life improvements. Ogre Battle came out on the PS1, but didn't get a subsequent re-release on modern hardware. It did get a virtual console release on Wii U, but I mean, we haven't been getting into, on the Switch, any N64 games on there. Um, of course, for, for Ogre Battle 64, and... This regular Ogre Battle has not come out on the on the uh, eShop. Not eShop, but the uh, Nintendo um, online service for the um, place for the uh, Super, for Super Nintendo games. And, well, Tactics Ogre Knight of Lotus hasn't really gotten much of a re-release either as well. Not even on the 3DS eShop when they started carrying... Game Boy Advance games, so there is room for additional releases there. Number three, the Gold Box games. I've covered platformers, I've covered tactical RPGs with a slight side of general JRPG, but mostly tactical. Now it's time for PC RPGs. I'm playing through the Gold Box games again now for a Let's Play on my blog, and as far as the gameplay goes, I'm having an absolute blast, but it all comes with an asterisk. I have to use an assist tool to help with auto-mapping and deal with how the game clumsily handles lack of breaks between fights and some of the issues with random encounters. I have to have a Wikipedia article, not Wikipedia, but a wiki article, or a copy of the actual first edition Dungeon Master's Guide handy to find out what some of the magic items do, because it's not explained in the game, it's not explained in the manual or the clue book what a 
blue-green ironstone does. And I have to cross-reference with the manual or a copy of the first edition player's handbook to find out what I find out what some of the spells do and how to best most effectively use them in combat. Further, the whole series, which starts with Pool of Radiance and goes on through Pools of Darkness, introduces a whole bunch of new classes in the second game, on top of which thus means, okay, do I want to just roll new characters from scratch here? Or do I want to have my or my party members change class partway through the game? And this is on top of all the other issues with the game trying to use the Dun Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition rules as wit written, like the game having cash to have weight, for example, on top of race-related level limits. In short, the Gold boss Box games are the perfect position for getting the same treatment that the, well, Bard's Tale series, which lets you import characters from Pool of Radiance, and for that matter, the Wasteland games. And it also, theoretically, could let you incorporate as options, a lot of the house rules that were used at the gaming table for Dungeons and Dragons First Edition, stuff like, well, for example, money, gold and jewels, not having to necessarily having weight, or at least not having to accommodate it at a very tight level, or for that matter, because new classes are included from Azure Bonds onward, making those classes available from game one, and on top of that, adding auto mapping, so you don't have to flip back, or of course as with um, Wasteland, make it so you don't have, so your journal entries are just, when they come up in the game, are just there. And maybe even using the options to include some common house rules from first edition of your game as well. Like for example, not having racial level restrictions or even racial class restrictions. And of course, this all counts somewhat double for the first six Might and Magic games and well, the first three or four wizardry games. In the latter case, the first three games of that got PC and uh, Super Nintendo releases um, through the Nintendo Power cartridge loading service thing in Japan. So theoretically, depending how you do this, you could also have the option to shift through like several different art styles, much as with the HD remasters of the Halo games and the Dark Spire on the Nintendo DS. Number four, the Wing Commander series. Well, we've done tactical RPGs, we've done Western RPGs, we've done platformers, now it's time to talk about space simulators. Here's the thing about home gaming today and space simulators then and now. When the first Wing Commander games came out, most people had some variety of joystick to use to play games in DOS because most people didn't have, you know, GUI interfaces that used a mouse. As time has gone on, the widespread use of joysticks has gone down, and the use of controllers have gone up. Assuming people aren't using, you know, mouse and keyboard. In fact, mouse and keyboard tend to be even more common than anything else, because you use mouse and keyboard for your strategy games, you use mouse and keyboard for your first-person shooters, you use mouse and keyboard for a lot more things than space simulators and flight simulators and mech simulators. And further, if you do own a joystick, a, a USB joystick, and you're playing a space simulator in DOS, then at, at least initially you have to jump through some additional configuration hoops that you may not have had to do in the DOS version originally back in the day. Now, while some space simulators, Wing Commander in particular, got console releases, for a lot of time when those games came out, the con controllers they were designed for, the Super Nintendo controller, the original PlayStation controller, often did not either have analog sticks on them, or those games had to be designed to count for the lack of one because of lack of availability for of controllers with analog sticks. Now, however, every console comes with a dual analog stick controller and one which generally has four face buttons and four shoulder buttons. And when you hook up your, your joystick over USB, if you have one, it streamlines the setup process considerably. We're at a point now where I think the old school space sim can be given brand new life on consoles. Ideally, if you had a modern joystick, and again, want to kick it old school that way, a remastered collection would be designed to basically streamline that whole setup process you have to deal with with DOSBox and just recognize it. Just go with the drivers and set all that stuff up on its own and make 
playing the game and setting everything up quick and easy, even with HOTAS. And of course, all of this naturally counts just as well with the X-Wing and the TIE Fighter games. Number 5, the Super Nintendo Shin Megami Tensei games. Well, I've covered predominantly tactical RPGs. I've covered Western-style dungeon crawlers. Now it's time for conventional JRPGs. The Shin Megami Tensei series is one of the biggest series that Atlas has ever put out. As far as Atlas is concerned, it is the house that Mega Ten built. This makes it a shame, actually, that so much of the earlier part of the series is so much less accessible. The Digital Devil Saga games have gotten re-releases, each Persona game has gotten at least one other release to keep the mind game in the minds of modern players. Whether it's the original Persona getting re-released on the PSP, um, the first half of the Persona 2 duology getting put out on the PSP with the second game being available through PlayStation Network, Persona 3 not just getting the Fez re-release, but also Persona 3 Fordable, and of course, Persona 4 Golden, and the new release of Persona 5 that's coming up as of this recording. However, the first two releases for the Super Nintendo, along with Shin Megami Tensei If, the spiritual predecessor of the Persona series, have been somewhat left by the wayside. I say somewhat because all three games got iOS releases in Japan, the first two got Android releases, but with the exception of the iOS versions, none of them have gotten a US release. Or rather, I, and by iOS versions, I mean of, like, the first game. Otherwise, you have to have be in Japan to play them on, like, modern handhelds, or you have to have some sort of, you know, modern retro console that supports translation patching to play the cartridges on original hardware, assuming you aren't playing them using a you know, in an emulator with a ROM with a fan translation like the footage you're looking at right now. I would love, love to see these three games get a remastered release on consoles with, again, some of the other quality of life improvements other games have gotten. From a demon compendium that helps you keep track of information you've already learned about demons, and along with an auto map, along with ways to kind of quick save so that, you know, when life happens, you can save your game step away, and go, and then come back later as you need to. I would also would think we need to have, of course, the option to switch between original and arranged version of the soundtrack, and maybe view concept art of characters and environments as you view them. And of course, there are plenty of other JRPG series from this time that you can apply to as well, from Breath of Fire to Lufia. But of all of the 16-bit JRPGs that have not gotten a similar remaster treatment. I think, like, more than the Quintet series, more than seeing a compilation collection of breath of the early Breath of the Fire games, like even going up to PS1, more than Lufia 1 and 2, I'd love to see Shin Megami Tensei 1 and 2 and if get this treatment. So, which remasters would you like to see? Um, would you get any of the ones I mentioned if they came out? If there are ones, games that I overlooked that you would like to get see get a similar treatment, what, what ones would you like to see get that? Please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear what games you'd like to see get the, um, get a new lease on life on modern consoles. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.